We've got an in-studio guest who flew in from Los Angeles to be here today to make a very special announcement. BJJ Black Belt wrestler from the Ohio State University. His name is AJ Agazarm, and he is somewhere in the building. All right. Well, she went to get him. Where'd he go? Bathroom? Um, all right. Well, now I could do the second one. I didn't know. I thought he was standing right over there. He's trying to save some time for us over here because I want to talk to AJ. This man is uh, somewhat notorious in the world of Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He's competed for Polaris. He's competed for uh, Quintet. He's competed all over the world. And he is a polarizing figure. He has gotten into it. He has talked some trash about the likes of Dylan Dennis and Joe Rogan and Eddie Bravo. He is a man who is known to speak his mind. And uh, I have never talked to him before in an official capacity on the record or in an interview of any kind, but I'm hearing he is a very colorful character. So he's joining us right now, coming in studio, the great AJ Agazarm. How are you, my friend? Oh, I'm good. Please. I'm good. Welcome. Glad to have made it. Yes. I'm glad you're here as well. I just got off the flight from South Korea. South Korea? Yeah. Please have a seat and we'll talk. I was, uh, I was there for, um, I was with uh, Spider Gear. Okay, well, come, please. Uh, talk into the microphone. Don't be shy. I heard you're Does not that very shy. Yes, come a little closer. See, there's a there's a. Oh, there's a kit. I know it's a bit of a mess of a situation. Now, did you bring me a gift? What's going on over there? Uh, Is that we'll for get, you? We'll get to okay, that. we'll get to that. Welcome. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's so great as to I meet was you. Saying, I was, yeah, please. I was in I was in South Korea, and um, yeah, I was with Spider Gear, a okay. company that manufactures a lot of my training gear. Okay. And um, yeah, it's just it was nice to be out there and and do a lot of their. I did a tour of their manufacturing facilities. Okay. And it uh it was nice to see how the best gear is made and and by who. <laughs> but normally I wouldn't do a do an interview like this, you know, it would it would take a while to to get into the plug. No, to, all the jet lag and oh, getting yeah, over yeah, it. I would need like Wait, a, did you actually fly from South Korea to New York? Well, I flew South Korea, LA, it was yeah. in LA and then LA here. Yeah. How long were you in LA for? But a but a second. A second. Yeah. Now, so. I, I, I hope I'm not putting you on blast here, but I have to say, I reach out to you Saturday night. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have we have a mutual friend, the great John Beer. Oh, yeah. Put us in touch. Legend in right. his own right. And uh, I say, hey, you know, would you like to come on the show? I think we could do a good interview via Skype or telephone. You say, say the word. I'm there in studio. And I ask you, where are you right now? You say L.A. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to call United. I'll be there. In a and you, you actually did it. You mm -hmm. weren't lying to me. You weren't in New You were not in New York when we spoke on Saturday night. I'm like you, Ariel. I'm a yeah. man of my word. And no, like I said, normally I wouldn't be able to do an interview like this, but do you drink coffee? I do, yeah. I have this mushroom coffee that I was on the plane <laughs> drinking. Okay. And it's it's oh, like coffee, but without all the jitter. Okay. This company, Four Sigmatic, it's this guy that's from Finland. and Two sponsors you've already shouted out. This is, this is a job well done on your part. I'm just I'm just living my life, my <laughs> best life. But this company, Four Sigmatic, is like the best coffee, and it's like coffee, but without all the jitter. It's oh. antioxidants. Actually, John Beer, yeah. our friend, he lives and dies by it. It's the best company. Is there actual mushrooms in there? It's it's kind of amazing that a guy like you spends all this time in front of know. a mic, doesn't yeah. know anything about mycology. No, I, well, I don't even know what that means. Mycology is the study of mushrooms, but it's mic. Okay. Uh, now, we're not talking about like mushrooms like fungi. Yeah. We're talking about the other kind of mushrooms. Straight mushrooms. Okay. What Forged from a, from a farm in Finland, brought over to the United States, brought over to the world. Okay. It's this Finnish guy by the name of Taro. He's it's just incredible. And it keeps me energized and allows me to do things like this. But Okay. When did you get to New York? Yesterday, last night. Okay. Like midnight. But you're in New York a lot, right? I, I frequent here. Yeah, but where's home? Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. Yeah. But I train a lot, but I'm based in LA. LA. Yeah. Even though you are the Florida boy. Born in Florida. And everyone says that. How are you living in LA and you're the no, considered it's the Florida? In your boy. Heart. It's my heart. Hollywood? I was born in Hollywood, Florida, yeah. and now I live in Hollywood, California. Oh, that's funny. Did you choose Hollywood, California because it reminded you of home? I chose Hollywood, California because it's it's sort of that fast-paced, interesting dynamic with all the people living there, you know, their their dream out with no blueprint. And right. that's something that I can relate to. And having done what I've done for how long it's been, I don't even know, like 15 years, li living that unordinary lifestyle as a martial artist, a jiu-jitsu practitioner. You are a black belt in J Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yes. You are a collegiate wrestler from The Ohio State University. Yes. Uh, I, I, I note that because I think it's a very unique thing. You, don't, you, you, you see a lot of black belts. You see a lot of collegiate wrestlers. You don't see D1 wrestlers who happen to be, like, you sort of 
conquered both worlds in in many respects but but you do have two amateur mma fights on your record and i and i don't want to bury the lead here because you are here to make a very special announcement is that correct yes and just for the record i, I have eight amateur i don't know if the other six are not reporting oh really because yeah. i only saw two on topology and they're right. usually yeah there's only i think there's only two reported but it was this was back in like oh five and it was like underground okay okay and it was it was a tournament so when's the last time you had an amateur fight 2006 it's been a while it's been a minute okay and that's how i got caught in jujitsu right and we will get to that but yeah. first let's make the announcement and then we're going to work our way backwards if you don't mind because i want the I want important the announcement yeah, that let's... i'm here to make unlike most of your guests yeah <laughs> <laughs> the floor is yours what yeah. do you got well i i you know i've been i've been looking and i i signed with an mma promotion that's about as dynamic as me and the only mma promotion that's as dynamic as me and that's bellator wow you have signed officially signed, officially send it over they they're they're signing it back over and sending it over to me today. If not, it's already done. Okay. And and how long were they courting you? I, yeah, it's been it's been a. I was looking for a, a company that was that had that that architecture that mattered, and that sort of architecture that had a competitive architecture that had value, and that's what I found in Bellator. Huh. You know, I come, I come from an unordinary background. You know, I went to high school. I graduated high school and. Then I went to college and I wrestled in college and got a degree in finance from the best university in the world in The Ohio State. And I was headed into corporate America and I'm not a corporate guy. And that was a lot of the things that I was looking at in the landscape. I saw all these other corporate companies that it's like climbing a corporate ladder. And to me, I, I'm not a corporate guy. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to kick the door down, cause havoc and, and, and get, you know, get and get out of there. And that's what I found in, in, in Bellator. It's a really dynamic company that's going to help the trajectory of my athletic career, and I'm excited. Why are you doing this? Why not? Why are you going to MMA? That's how I started jujitsu. Right. Okay, so let's start back at the beginning. You're in high school, right? Why do you not wear diapers anymore? Well, I know, but you you seem to have a pretty good life as a jujitsu practitioner, right? Mm. Why are you going into, the, like, is there something about MMA that's calling you right now? Why, you know, like, why not stay on this jujitsu train? Yeah, I... I I think it, 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 you know, it's, it goes back further than that. Okay. And how I started jujitsu. So tell us, how did you start? I, um, I was with a, a friend of mine that was wrestling and he was preparing for an MMA fight. He asked me to corner him. We were working together for a couple of weeks. At that time it was only needed a couple of weeks to train for an amateur fight, but, um, we went to the venue together and, uh, the promoter came up in typical promoter fashion. He's like, man, he's like, one of the guys didn't show up and he, and he looked at me and he's like, He's about your weight. You want to do an MMA fight? <laughs> I swear to God. <laughs> I looked at my friend. I looked at the promoter and I said, shrugged my shoulders and I said, I don't see why not. You're 16. 16, 17, yeah. And did you wrestle at the time? Yeah, I was wrestling. Okay. Jiu-jitsu? No. Only no, wrestling? No, no jiu-jitsu. Yeah, so the only thing you had in your back pocket was wrestling. And a lot of craziness. Yeah, testosterone. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it was testosterone. It was more of just adventure. I was seeking that, and I, I, and I was kind of excited because my friend was doing the fight as well, and we were together. But I did it, dodged a few punches, took the guy down, picked him up, slammed him on the, t on the canvas, and uh, wrapped my arms around him. And what I thought at the time was a choke, and little did I know that was probably the ugliest idea of a choke that anyone could ever consider, and I won. I jumped on the cage like Tito Ortiz and yeah. was like, yeah, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the best. Were you, were you a UFC fan? Like, had you seen it before? I had, I had watched, so it's, it's kind of funny. I know you had Tito. Has Tito been on already? No, no, later. Okay, I know. So, he's, so it's, it's, you know, it's sort of uh, cool to see being on this show and yeah. being a fan of yours for as long as I have been to not only be on this show, to be on, on a show that some of the idols that I've looked up to for, for a long period of time. And, yeah, I followed Tito's career for for quite a while I, I saw him coming out every day to the Eminem song with the with a dual flag yeah and uh yeah it was it was certainly compelling for me but I didn't get I did not get into that until after I had no idea what MMA was okay. my friend just told me about a cage fight to do that he was doing and I went with him and then that's when they said hey do you want to do this and I said well I don't see why not where do I sign and I did it I called a friend of mine up who's been a mentor for me for since I was a kid and he told me about this jujitsu academy. And um, it was right right around where we lived. In Florida. In Florida. Okay. He called he called the guy up. His name is Eduardo de Lima. He's a he's now a fifth degree black belt. And he called him up and he said, I have a wrestler 
just did an MMA fight. He wants to learn Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And this is back in 05, 06 when yeah. that was sort of like laughable. Yeah. He laughed on the phone and said, bring the wrestler to me and hung up. <laughs> and we went there, went to this facility. It's like an old, old warehouse, like an industrial complex in Clearwater, Florida. And walked up and my mentor said, said to uh, Eduardo, I want you to make him into a world champion. And I'll never forget this. The guy, he's got really bushy eyebrows, really big ears. And he looked at me and he's like, okay. And he turned, walked over to this box, grabbed this raggedy kimono out, dusted it off, threw it at me. And he's like, go, put this on. I didn't even know how to tie the pants. I came out, the belt was all whacked up. I got on the mat and I was like a wrestler. At the, I mean, I was a wrestler. Yeah. That's all I knew was wrestling. And I was like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go beast this workout. I never been tapped out so many times in my life. Wow. And there was a guy by the name of Rich Travis who was the highest belt at the time, brown belt. And he, uh, he, he mopped the floor with me. But it was, I felt like I discovered something that I shouldn't have. I was in a room full of middle-aged men and a guy who spoke barely any English. And I got hooked on it and I couldn't get out of it. And I, I loved it. You know, it was, it was like wrestling, but it was designed in a way that, could, that I could relate to. And I saw a lot of discovery and opportunity to really, you know, to add my own sort of spin on things. And, and uh, since then, it's been one of those things that I just, I thoroughly enjoyed. I did seven more fights after that. And I told myself, uh, had a, I had a sit down conversation and I uh, told myself that I wasn't going to do any more MMA fights until I got my black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu because I learned the importance and the value of being of what being a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu meant. And if you look now in MMA, and I'm sure we'll get into it, but it's sort of absent. And there's there's no real specialist of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu anymore. Sure, you have your guys like Jacare and Damian Maia, um, but that. It's, it's something that's missing, and there certainly hasn't been a guy that has a, has a wrestling background as extensive as I do, wrestling for Division One College in Ohio State and also at the top of the chain when it comes to jiu-jitsu. And I think this is, a, this is, this is great for Bellator. They've, n nobody in the history of MMA has signed anything like this. This is the first of its kind. They're, they're, they're probably popping champagne bottles right now. They just landed the biggest deal. So it's um, when you say it's the first of its kind, what do you mean by that? Do you know any high level wrestlers that are, are um, world champions in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? OK, so that's what you mean. Yeah, well, that's why I was giving you props earlier. I was mm. saying it's, it's very rare that we see someone who has your credentials in both worlds. We either see them coming right. out of college. Singular. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm curious while you were at first, you went to community college, right? And then you Correct. transferred to Ohio State. While you were wrestling in college, were you also still practicing jujitsu? And if so, did the jujitsu help your wrestling? Yeah, I appreciate you bringing up the community college. So I, out of high school, I got a I got a scholarship to wrestle at an NAI school, University mm -hmm. of the Cumberlands, and um, it was cool. I liked it, but at that time, that's when I, I you know I discovered jujitsu. I came back, and uh, Carlos Gracie Jr. was doing a seminar, and I was a white belt. And we did the seminar and he showed he was spending an odd amount of time working with me and helping me through the through the moves. And I, I you know I sort of felt a little weird about it because he was paying a lot of attention to me and, uh, and not the other people in the room. And um, at the end of the at the end of the seminar, my professor Eduardo pulled up, came up to me and he, and he said, uh, AJ, I got to talk to you. And I was like, man, I, I did something wrong. I had to have done forgot to take the trash out, stepped on the mats with my shoes, something, some idiot m white belt move. And he said, um, Master Carlos Gracie wants to know if you want to move to Brazil and live with him and his family and get your black belt. That was a white belt. Wow. Didn't even know Brazilian jiu-jitsu, what, what that meant, the value of that. For me, wrestling and graduating as an athlete, you graduate in the top 1% of your class and you, I always had aspirations to be at Ohio State. That was what my goal was, just to start at the NAI college and then pick up stuff and move over to Ohio. And <clears throat> I had dreamed about that doing since I, since I started wrestling. And, you know, I, I was at a big fork in the road. Do I go to college? Do I get my degree at, at Ohio State? Or do I move to Brazil to get my black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu? You chose to stay. I chose to pack all my stuff up and went. And I went to Ohio. Yeah. 
it was before that that I, you know, I, I, I remember getting really, really good, really, really fast. I got my blue belt. I was awarded my blue belt in three months, which is, is pretty fast. And um, I won the Pan American Games in, in the gi, not no gi, in the gi. It was a true testament to my uh, professor's teaching abilities and being able to condition and train me and, and break a lot of those bad habits that a lot of wrestlers experience when they're starting to train in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in the kimono specifically, specifically the kimono because it's not wrestling. There's there's things that they can grab onto. There's chokes that are happening and it's, it's completely, con you know, it contrasts wrestling in a lot of ways. And uh, I, had, I had some early success. I remember telling myself that I got really, really good, really, really fast, and that I would, would eventually catch up. But it was that time that I moved to Ohio. And I'd, I thought to myself, I'm gonna have to put jujitsu on hold. I, I, I didn't know what that meant, but I, I knew I would come back to it. It wasn't until my aunt, I had family up in Ohio who, who uh, housed me for the first year. And I stayed with her and lived with her. She told me that there was this Gracie Jiu Jitsu gym so that when I, li when I lived there, I could, I, she kind of enticed me to go. And she's like, well, there's this Gracie Jiu Jitsu Academy in Westerville, Ohio, you could go to. And I said, all right, well, I'll go check it out. I walked in and it's a Helsin Gracie affiliate by a guy, a guy by the name of Robin Geisler. And I introduced my, walked myself in there introduced myself and I said, hey, I'm AJ Agazar, I blue belt under Eduardo de Lima through Gracie Baja. I have no, uh, no, um, I, d I have no desire to change teams. I just would like a place to train because the world championships in three months and I would love to do that as a blue belt. And he said, yeah, man, sure, no problem. Come here, train. I trained there for three months every day. Um, at that time I was juggling, um, because I was transferring from an NAI college to, to the university, I had to make up for the gap in credits that mm. allowed me to transfer. And part of that meant because I was getting residency, I had to maintain a, a 20 hour course week in college. Do you know what the average course load for a student is in, in, cl in class? Oh my, 11, 12? 11, 12. Yeah, is, so, that, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So I. I had almost essentially double my my yeah. my studies. Yeah. On top of that, I was working a forty-hour work week at a bank. Wow. And I was training to for the world championships. And I felt something there that was really unique, and I I'd never experienced it in my competitive career. I did I did soccer growing up. I did swimming. I did football. I did cross country. I did did um, track and field, I did weightlifting, and I did wrestling. And even the wrestling that I experienced, I wrestled on the, the Fargo National Level, wrestled in the state tournament, wrestled over up at Blair Academy with, with uh, Coach Buxton and uh, Russ, Russ Cozart and Russ Shank, and really experienced, I, I felt, wrestling at that time at a, at, a, at a decent level. But competing in the Pan Ams and winning that, it was a, it was a surreal feeling that I, I wanted to duplicate, and I, I, I chased that in the World Championships. And and Robin and, and the team at Helsin helped prepare me for that, and I went there and, and um, managed to win. I had seven matches. It was again, it was in the Gi, and um, it was it was pretty cool. When did you graduate? Uh, college. Yeah. 2010. 2000. Yeah. 2010. So when when you left. You decided to go down the the path of BJJ, right? That's when you really started to, because you didn't have a black belt when you graduated, right? Well, no, I, I so I when I came back after the World Championships and won the World Championships, we had a visit from Helson. Oh, and Helson's like, ah, oh, you know, man, you want to train here, man? You have to leave Gracie Baja. Ah, uh. and for me, no matter what it is, jujitsu, relationships, loyalty is really important. And I had that relationship, that mentorship with Eduardo and Car Master Carlos, and that was important to me. And I, I knew that my life was getting ready to take a dramatic shift in study and wrestling, and I, couldn't be, I wouldn't be able to split the two. But the team at Helsin was, was phenomenal. You know, it, it, uh, you know, I had Robin Geisler working with me. Aaron Fry was running a strength and conditioning coach over at, uh, at Team Edge, and they really helped set that foundation for me and, and facilitated the the uh, success at the world championships, but I, I decided to just focus on studies, focus on work and, and wrestling for Ohio state. And, um, you're right. I graduated 2010, 11, 
and I went back to Florida. I started training with Eduardo again and, and rehoning my skills. It was when, it was during that time though, I was no longer training jujitsu. I was just wrestling and working and I, I couldn't go back to the Helsing Academy because I didn't want to change it. So I just was competing without training with what I, with the foundation that I, I had established early on with, with Eduardo. And I would go around to all these smaller tournaments competing in every single that I, every single thing that I could possibly do. And I was doing nagas every week and they were flying me out doing ref as a referee and I was su subbing refereeing and, and competing. And, uh, it was, it was cool. It wasn't until the following year that I went back to the, to the world championships and, um, registered as a blue belt. So I was, I was a year and seven months. And apparently I, there had been letters that were written to the Federation that <clears throat> I don't think I've ever told this to anybody, but people wrote letters to the Federation saying that it was unfair that I get to be able to compete at the blue belt level again when I had already won the world championships. So I was, <clears throat> cha uh, Eduardo changed my belt the night before the tournament mm. and I was put into the purple belt division and that's that's never been done and you have to if you're never never been done and never will be done in in, in IBJJF there's too it's too organized now but I ended up competing in the purple belt division and I, I took third I lost in the semis to some guy holding my sleeves and I was frustrated but you know I, I saw some space for improvement and and skill development and not having trained at all accomplishing third place at the world championships and that mm. was cool i uh continued competing at the purple belt division and uh, started you know hitting a lot of hurdles competitively because i was splitting my focus i went back to ohio state graduated wrestled moved back to ohio then i was awarded my brown belt and it wasn't until then you know that i decided to go out to california and do the pan american games and when I was focused on just jujitsu and not working and not school and just, just, just the art of Brazilian jujitsu, I, I wasn't trying to be the wrestler that was, that was good at jujitsu. I was trying to hone my skills as a jujitsu practitioner. So I would pull guard in every single one of my matches, which I don't know if you know, but it's sort of unorthodox for a wrestler. He wants to come in, mm -hmm. take the guy down, dominate the top position and get past his legs and secure a, a, a you know, pinning, position and and then find the submission but i didn't want i didn't want to just let limit my my skill set in jujitsu to that capacity so i started pulling guard in every single one of my matches so i could understand the essence of what brazilian jiu-jitsu was i started competing all around the world um, it was in my brown belt career that i took my first flight overseas competitively i'd been out of the country once before that but it wasn't until then that i um did the European championships and I was really, you know, I was nervous. I was flying overseas to compete in something that I had no idea that was going on with people that I had just met and just started sort of becoming acquaint acquainted with. And it was surreal. <laughs> it was, it was insane. How'd you do? I did good. I, I, the Europeans at Brown Belt, I think I, yeah, I took third twice. But since then, I've been in 41 countries competing all over, competing in some of the biggest shows with the best organizations and living my life as, as a jiu-jitsu practitioner. And it was in that time that I was a brown belt that uh, Carlos Gracie Jr. phoned me up and said, hey, we're, you know, we've moved out shop. We moved shop out here to L.A. And this was in 07 was the first year that the Federation was in, in, in California, in 06. It was in Brazil and had never been in, 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 uh, in California before that. He said they all kind of put up shop and started living out there in California. And I asked me if I wanted to live out there with him and his son, Chiron Gracie. So the opportunity that I thought was once in a lifetime circled its way back. Wow, that's amazing. And that was a true testament. I think that I was knowing I was in the right place with the right people. And... I just started training, teaching, working with Chiron and working with all the guys there at Gracie Baja. And then I went on a, th a three year tour, just traveling, going from one, one city to the next, one country to the next, training, competing with people all over. 
and living life in in, a, in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu capacity. And um, it's been one hell of a ride. And look, I, I cover MMA. I have a great appreciation for jiu-jitsu, but in terms of like what I cover and follow day to day, live and breathe, it's obviously mixed martial arts. But even if you're in the MMA world, you are cognizant of what's going on in jiu-jitsu and kickboxing and boxing. It's, you know, all the other martial arts. So obviously jiu-jitsu is so close to our sport. I'm very cognizant of what is going on. And I feel, and correct me if you feel otherwise, we are in a special time for jiu-jitsu where it's not just about wins and losses and belts. There are true personalities coming out here because I think the jiu-jitsu world has realized that you need to do a little more to sort of reach the biggest audience possible. So there are personalities like yourself, like Gary Tonin, like Dylan Dennis. There are, there are organizations like Submission Underground and Polaris and Quintet. It seems to be like like there's there's a really th- th- there's a really strong approach to try to get the sport out there in front of as as many eyeballs as possible and you're one of those guys you're a very polarizing figure in the sport somewhat controversial why is that thank why, thank you i guess yeah well, why why do you think that is why do why what when i said that you were on the show why was it so why did i get people being like screw that guy oh it's awesome that he's on the show why do people feel why are mm. they so split on you well, i i think it it points to a, an er, i know earlier times and um, it's 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 funny that you you got this right here. What do I have? Oh, my black belt. I work hard for that one. That this is one. a black belt from. Yes. Metamorphs. Yes. Are they still around? You know they're not. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. Um, do they owe you money? Are you a black belt? Of course not. So why do you have this? They sent that to me as uh, like an invitation to come to one of their events. It was in a box, and I thought it was very ironic to send that to someone because that's something that you should earn right maybe in hosting shows i could be a, a black belt but. yeah maybe if it was a plaque with a picture but I, I don't know are you offended by that not at all okay you're a black belt in journalism there you go <laughs> that's what i wanted to say you said it better than me i think that uh meta morris was was very um they kind of started it it was 2012. You had the first Metamorphs. Yeah. And at that time, I was a brown belt. I had just done the ADCC trials, which had some success and won and secured my ticket to the Beijing, to the Olympics of grappling. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That time was Metamorphs one. And this was, it was something bizarre. Nobody had ever seen anything like this. Yeah. And, and it was like, it was like Woodstock. Yeah. It's like, and that's because it, it didn't, it didn't seem real because it wasn't. It wasn't financially viable to to sustain that model for for show after show after show. They were shelling out lots of money, securing these guys, and they were really setting a very high precedence for any anybody else that wanted to get into it. Um, and yeah, they 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 changed the game because up until that point, there had only been two organizations: the IBJJF mm. and the ADCCC, ADCC, mm. which anybody knows. If you want to be considered anything, any you want to be considered top or important or relevant in jujitsu, you have to have those titles. Mm. And then Metamorphs came in and uh, erupted the entire landscape, mm. and everybody started talking about Metamorphs and being on the show Metamorphs, and um, it was very very cool. Unfortunately, you know. Um, like I said, it wasn't financially viable, and it's in the past, but it um, it couldn't sustain that. So they started bringing on athletes, and I say they, but it was, um, you know, it wasn't it wasn't sustainable any longer, and um, you know, it, it fell through. It was in that fall through that sprung all of these other tournaments, mm. and I was very much involved with that mm. because it was it was like. When I left college, I have a degree in finance. I go become, a, you know, you go in corporate America and climb the corporate ladder. That's a, it, it, for me, competition stopped being about winning titles and, and winning championships and became more about wanting to live my life passionately and doing what I love for a living. And that metamorphosis bridge that gap and, and, I, and you saw a vision there with, with the guys that were running it and they really kind of gave a big perspective of what was possible and when that fell through 
another organization, Polaris, started popping up, you know, they had they had joked about it. They're like, well, what if we don't pay you? Like Metamorris didn't. Are you going to do our tournament? What? Yeah. That's a weird joke. Yeah, weird. But I got it. I understood it. And it and it resonated to me in me because I wanted to live my life doing what I love in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I wanted other people, I wanted to inspire other people to do that. But I wasn't the only athlete that was not being paid. There were other people but nobody else was speaking up about it. So mm. I you know, I, I brought it to light in hopes of that it would be, you know, sort of resolved and we could progress forward as a community and um a group of people that are, are trying to do this on a, on a bigger scale. Then you saw Polaris um, fight to win, um, Submission Underground, Copa Podio, Bear Coot, ACB. At the time before Bear Coot was Bear Coot, it was ACB Jiu Jitsu with different rules. It was just a super fight show. They, everyone, everyone was trying to emulate what Meta Morris did. And then, you know, in this time, you started to see all these other things pop up. But it's it became now now what what was a global enterprise in a family became a spectator driven sport worldwide. Which is good. Which is which is great. It's good yeah. for the sport, and it has created characters and rivalries and personalities. Um, one of the more notable ones, I would say, is you and Dylan Dennis. What's your beef with Dylan? What's the issue there? Tell us what he's a Bellator guy too. Do you think that I spent thousands of dollars and flew all the way across the country to talk about Dylan Dennis? No, but there is a history there, and he's a very notable name in the world of MMA. And if we're going to put the cards on the table, I believe you actually brought him up first to me when we were Did texting. I? Yes. Did you, I? You called him, uh, well, I think, unless you were speaking about someone else, Connors. Look, look, Con Dylan Dennis was plucked from obscurity with no real accomplishments in BJJ to be an entourage member for Conor McGregor. He didn't have credentials before he was zero. He's got he's got he's got a in batting terms he's got a batting average of five hundred in at black belt. Okay. He's got like thirty matches total. How many? You know how many matches I have? Close to a hundred, right? Two hundred. Two hundred. Okay. That's a substantial amount of 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 it's track a history. It's yeah. a big difference. And guys, even guys at the elite level. But you've competed I just against him, right? Destroyed him twice. Did I think he, it's yeah, he's been used as well, right? It's it's just disrespectful. Just, no, no, no. But uh, you brought him up first, so I thought that you had a, an issue with him when we were texting. I didn't know that it was my issue. Is this Ariel? It's it's disrespectful to consider yourself the face of Bra Brazilian Jiu Jitsu right. when you have a number of guys that are competing at a much higher level with much better results. Guys like JT Torres, Lucas Lepre, Co Char uh, Philippe Pena, Cobrinha, Bouchesha, Hadra Gracie. That's the face of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Do you think it's a bit of an act, though? Whether it is or it isn't, he's wrong. Right. And does it bother you? Does it bother the community that he says these things, or does everyone just laugh, you know, at, at, mm. at, at, sort of at him as opposed to with him? There, there certainly are a lot of people that find it comical what he's doing, but yeah. I think that, uh, you know, look at look at look at his skill set. What what has he accomplished? He destroyed Conor McGregor. In terms of what, like he made him a worse fighter? You think? Uh, absolutely. Uh -huh. Conor McGregor's jujitsu is, it, it's not. It's not that Conor McGregor's uh, jujitsu is bad. It's just non-existent. And Dylan was was acquired to bring on and talk, you know, and help him with that that match with Nate. Yeah. But Conor needed more of an an all-encompassing style. And, and Dylan, you know, listen, Dylan had a lot of success in the early bouts, in the early match, in the early belts, and he's got really good Dars chokes and guillotines. And that's probably why Conor, you know, helped him because that's. Nate Diaz's right. specialty. Right. But if you look, anybody that has any sort of indication or um, slight ground game has exposed Connor in, in, in every way possible. Nate did it, um, Chad did it, and now Khabib. Which, let's be honest, uh, that that whole situation, Ariel, you could you could have submitted uh connor well i don't know about that our friend our friend john beer who i who is an entrepreneur by trade and a one stripe blue belt i've done three lessons with could could submit connor mcgregor what weight will you fight at in bellator i don't know what do you think whatever we you know who, what weight i fight and who i fight um is a is a is a road that we could go down and, and discuss and i could give you that exclusive depending on how this interview goes not right now 
but I think that you're keeping your cards close to your vest on this one. You got to take it nice and easy. That's a big. That's the biggest question. I feel like that's sort of like a formality. No, no, it's 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 not developed yet. Okay, there are a lot. The reason I ask is because he fights at one seventy, and I feel like this could be a big fight for them. Do you think it would be a big fight? I think so. Why? Uh, you're two very big personalities. There's clearly some kind of... So it's big personalities that's the selling point? Uh, Listen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's... Okay. <laughs> no. Well, well, here's... Let's look at it theoretically. Let's right. look at it. Let's let's lay it all out there. Our jiu-jitsu would nullify each other. I got even actually, a, a, you know, jiu-jitsu is more comprehensive than his portfolio. Okay. And... I love this, by the way. This is great. We're selling the fight right here. Mm. This is awesome. Are we selling a fight or are we just like realizing the the, the ask inadequacy me. of Dylan Danis? <laughs> well, see, that's why I turn to you because you're the expert when it comes to this. So that was your reasoning for understanding my whole background to understand that I'm an expert? You didn't know that beforehand? Well, it's different when you speak to someone. Mm. You know what I mean? Gotcha. Obviously, I've read about you. I know about you. But when you actually, the way you broke it all down was fascinating, I thought, in depth. In detail. It's nice to have, it's nice to be sick. You know what? <laughs> oh, one second. What's happening? Let's take a break. Are you pulling out your Instagram? Yeah, you know what? I just want to sit here and acknowledge the fact that I am face to face with, with the, man, the legend. The man, the myth, the legend. And let me tell you something. I had followed your career for quite a while. Give me a nice big smile. Hello, everyone. On the floor. That's it? All right. I just put a picture. You're very prolific on, on social media. What were we talking about? You have 100 plus thousand on Instagram, but we need to build up your Twitter as well. I just followed you. You did. I don't know if you saw that. You did, and I I appreciate that. And I told you I wasn't going to be on the show unless you followed me. Yeah. And then I think I saw somebody tweet back and said, I'm not going to tune in unless you follow me. (laughs) I did not follow that individual, just for the record. Oh, okay. Um, Should I? But I feel like this interview was going really well until I brought up Dylan, and now it's taking a left turn. It's like well, I flew all this way to be here no, with you and to well, talk I'm about things, asking, and you I'm bringing it up a guy it. that has not is no relevancy whatsoever. He's not why accomplished you, anything in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Why did you te- when you text me? Why did you say I'm going to wipe the? I think you're fabricating. Really? Yeah. Do you want me to put, bust it out? It must have been my you secretary. Posted, you posted one of my t- my my text to you on your Instagram. I saw that. What did the it text was a nice say? one? It just said yeah. like yeah, but I I thought you were 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 were, were, were mm. talking shop here boys will be boys if it was off the record it was off the record i, I wasn't aware jujitsu was plucked from, or Con- <laughs> dylan was plucked from obscurity with okay. no real accomplishments in bjj to be an entourage member for conor mcgregor who who let's be honest like if you think about conor mcgregor he what he has done for the sport is is incredible yeah he is he is somebody that has not a lot in his tools in his tools and has accomplished some of the most impressive things about MMA. Yeah. If you think about it, mixed martial arts, he's not a mixed martial artist. His his game is very singular. He's got he's a very good striker with very good timing. That's it. And that's why I make this comparison. It, and and he has Dylan in his camp and Dylan's claiming to be the face of jiu-jitsu. Well, then how come we're not seeing such a, a compelling grappling artist in Conor McGregor? Yeah. Well, you, it's not like you osmosis, know. you know. Just cuz one guy's good and he's training with him. Conor will never ever be able to 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 uh, fill that gap in in grappling, he can spend the next ten years. He'll never. He's so far behind. It's insane. Look at that match with Khabib. Yeah. He didn't even tap to a choke that was a neck crank. I'm telling you right now, you, your hmm. son Oliver could could have what? gone out of that. <laughs> How do you know my son's name? Uh, I know a lot. This guy. <laughs> Listen, I, I brought this for you. And, and oh wow. And we're talking about You're such com- a mensch. We're talking about compelling. Yes, you know, companies that are, are very dynamic and yes. Should I, I open this? You, have you ever received a gift? No, from there? I've never. Yeah, well, yeah, you can. Well, open sometimes this. people bring me like their fight shirts. Can uh, I open this right now? Yeah, of course. Yep, I think you'll you'll appreciate that. Is it from Jake Shields? What's going no. on there? No, no. What's happening with you and Jake? You got a lot of beefs. I'm trying to smooth yeah. it over before mm. you come into our world here. Why? Why would you want to smooth that over? Well, I want you to be. Is it Ariel the Smooth uh, Hawani? I, I want. Well, you know who is nicknamed Smooth. Benson Henderson, right. another guy you have a history what with. What weight does he fight? Uh, 170. Mm. You're going to fight? Okay, let's open this. Thanks. It says thanks. It's a nice little T-Rex. Ariel, you're terrific. <laughs> <laughs> this is incredible. Best AJ. You know what we call you? Mm. A mensch. Great. Do you know what that means? I got this gift for you. <laughs> okay. And uh, I wanted to share with you, like, being a part of a company that has... 
you know, as dynamic as Bellator and other companies that I'm, I'm aligned with. Yeah. And I think that. Can I open it now? I wanted to share with you. Wow. This is a first. This is incredible. Is it lingerie? It might be. Well, I really appreciate this. You didn't have to do it. Wow. Can I it's, open? A, it's sort of like a carapace. Yeah, go ahead. Bring it up. Lion's mane. So this is the the, the mushroom coffee I was telling you about yeah, by Four wait. Sigmatic. Sorry about the box. It wasn't traveling. No. Nah, I brought I mean, it. The fact that you actually did this is incredible. And this is a great, by the way. You'll you love this. Yeah? Yeah. It, it helps you focus. It's going to make me high? This is a book all about mushrooms by Four Sigmatic. There it is. I'm trying to it get it. It gives you the time. whole history. Wow. And understanding of it and how Taro just took this company from Finland and brought it over to the United States. This and is very thoughtful. changed the game. Oh, it's incredible. What else do we have in there? Ah, yes. Oh. This is a rash guard. Yes. And I've heard I'm, of these. I know what you're probably thinking, right? I don't train. I don't need this. How do you know? I know. You know so who wears these a lot? This is John your, Danaher. This is for your son, Oliver. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is so that he can start training one day and yeah. choke you out And, when and I will tell him that at the time, the future Bellator champion gave me this. Yeah. And I think we have one. Oh, look at this. Now, okay. This is... This is the most in, impressive thing in that bag. This is, do, have you seen this? Uh, well, I, I, I know it's like a play off of the Supreme logo and Poha is something, but I don't, I've never actually seen this. None of that. Okay. <laughs> Everyday Pohada is a phrase that has been coined by uh, none other than Homo Obahal. He's like s- many times, five, six, seven times. I don't even know how to count. He's been in the final 17 times, but I trained with him. I trained my Brazilian jiu-jitsu with him in Northridge, California. Wow. And he started this company, Everyday Pohada, to represent what the essence of jiu-jitsu and mindset needs to be. And every day is a fight. Every day, Pohada means fight. Yeah. And, um, you know, he talks about some of the people that represent that mindset the best. Nick and Nate, yourself, your you're everyday grinding here to, to hustle. I remember you when you were scrounging for interviews and the whole Thank thing you. that happened with the UFC and now here you are today, buttering up to a, a more of a corporate world, but <laughs> this is uh, <laughs> this is uh, this is good for you. I uh, <laughs> why don't you put it on right now? Right now, over my shirt? Yeah. Wow. Can I ask, um, you, you, you hang out a lot with Nick Diaz. I do. Now, how does that work? Because you had the beef with Jake Shields, and but also with Nick. We'll get you, there. Before okay. we get, I want you to see 540 and Oliver, whenever he's down in San Diego <laughs> and he leaves this bitter and cold place of New York. Yeah. And he I comes to San Diego, California. I want him to come train. To where? The, he, he can train with you? He can train with me. Can you get will, ears like you? How do you listen to anything in those ears? What? Those ears. What? <laughs> no, really. Like, is there any opening there, especially in the left one? You know, I get, I get this question asked a lot. Everyone, I'm dying to touch it. It's you want to? Can I? Has this been done? No, this we're, is. We're just, reaching all new heights here. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> Ariel Hawani, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, good. That just happened. I never got to touch it. I can't. Same. <laughs> What's going on with you and Nick? You guys are like. Uh, has anyone ever told you, you look a lot like Canelo Alvarez? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm. Is, have you heard that one before? Never. Never. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> You're like a mix between Canelo Alvarez and Sean William Scott mm. with the hair. Thank you. But you and Nick, you take a lot of shirtless photos together, a lot of ab shots. Do you like that? <laughs> I mean, I can send I, you I, some I, I, now I, that we're having. I th- see him flexing. Now that we're text messaging each yeah, other. I like it. Yeah. Is, he, is he coming back? Can you, can you give us some insight into that? Insight about Nick Diaz. Yeah. What do you want to know? Is he actually fighting? He's fighting every single day. Every day, Pohada, is that, yeah. that's him. You, could, you put in the Mar- shirt on. In March, is he going to fight? Is that a thing? Who was who it that he's supposed to fight? Who was uh, it? That Masvidal. He, Masvidal, right? Yeah. Is that a fight that you, you're the journalist. Yeah. You know all the ins and outs. Yeah, is yeah, that yeah. a fight that you want to see? Uh, sure. Why? I'm, I'll tell you this. I think we miss Nick Diaz. He's a legend. It's mm. a little toy of him right back there. Mm. Love watching him. Uh, have had many great moments with him. I want him to come back if it's for the right reasons. You think Masvidal is the right reason? No, no, no. I'm saying not because he needs the money or this or that. It's been four years. I want him to come back. I learned a very valuable lesson with Nick early in my career. Mm -hmm. I asked him, are you excited for this fight? And he got really mad at me. He doesn't like that word. And I understood where he was coming from later on. We're getting kicked in the head. Yeah, it was a stupid question. So Nick Diaz has had this love-hate relationship, I think, with the sport of cage fighting. And I want him to come back because he wants to, not because some promoter is luring him back with money or he needs him. Or some, I don't know the reasons. I haven't talked to him. That's but a good point that you bring up. And honestly, 
if Nick's going to do anything, yeah. his heart's going to be in it completely. And that's what makes him the best fighter that the world has ever seen. Is it in it? And if he's going to to come back after a four-year layoff, given everything that's happened, I'm, I'm, you know, you're a very good journalist. You understand psychology sure. really well. Think about the psychology of him and everything that has happened in his life for the last six years. Yeah, a lot. A lot. Substantially. Yeah. And if he's, you know, it's not a matter of if he's going to come back. It's it's why. Yeah. Why is he going to come back? To come back to fight Masvidal? Why? Yeah. What about a rematch with Anderson Silva? Yeah. What about him and versus GSP? Do you think GSP would take that match? I'm not sure, but I know Anderson wants that fight. I know that for a fact. I, you know, God, man, he's 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 he is the greatest fighter of all time. He really is. Every fighter aspires to be like Nick Diaz, and just having been around him for the time that I had. I've been and understanding his psyche and had the way he operates and he's he's very efficient and effective in every single thing that he does not just fighting mm. because he's got his daily routine and I know what it looks like on social media because I'm with him every day and do you live together yeah in LA okay yep and he sometimes um, I wake up at 6 30 a.m eastern time and you like see him out and I, and like I look at his Instagram story and like he's currently in a club on a Tuesday night in Las Vegas right and I'm not passing judgment i'm like wow my life could not be any more different i have to get my kids ready for school it's just amazing right and so i don't know what kind of physical state he's in mental state i just want to know if this is a in fact a real thing and b if he's coming back for the right reasons well i didn't i didn't come here to talk about nick diaz no i know <laughs> although <laughs> I, I love nick yeah listen he's he's gonna fight and when he does you'll know it okay he's like i said i i i feel privileged in in being i bet just around him and, and seeing how everything, all, all the thought that goes into to fighting that he, 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 you know, kind of just moves in that, in that whole mentality. It's, it's who he is. It's just not something that he turns on. It's not something that he gets excited about. It's, it's who he is. And when guys like, you know, Ben Askren or Masvidal or anybody else that, that can't hold a candle to his name or calling him out, it's offensive. Hmm. He is the greatest fighter of all time. There's no fighter. Way. There's yeah. There, every sense of the word. Every sense of the word. He's he's been fighting his whole life since he was a kid. Hmm. Think about what he has. Look, think about what he has done for his brother. Hmm. I I have brothers. You, I, you have brothers. Yeah, yeah. Too. Are you the oldest? No, youngest. Second, youngest. Yeah. Think about what your older brother did for you. Yeah. Growing up and and the the you know the example that he he gave you, and and the lessons. You know, I I don't know the family dynamic between you, but I I've seen it between Nick and Nate, and Nick did for Nate. Yeah. Is 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 incredible they're two of the biggest draws the ufc has ever seen it's incredible so like i said i didn't come here to talk about Nick. Okay, i came here enough. to talk about bellator yeah when are you going to debut um i don't know I, I you know like i said you just signed i just signed they courted you they other courted people him. did other people did and, and like i said it was for me it was about finding that that architecture that made sense that competitive architecture that had value for me I, i'm not trying to climb the corporate ladder yeah. Uh, these other organizations are like climbing the corporate ladder. I, I'm I'm a guy that's going to go in, kick the go door down, wreak, cause havoc, and I found that in Bellator. And and these are guys that are, you know, in all, you know, all serious. I was at the show in L.A. Um, a couple months back when um, Chael destroyed Tito. And <laughs> <laughs> what? okay, go ahead. Yes, yes. I mean, I love Chael, but it but was what? a good show at the Forum. Yeah, Chell yeah, yeah, Chel destroyed. Yeah, Chell destroyed Tito. <laughs> I don't remember seeing you there. I wasn't. I wasn't. That's why I'm laughing because I wish I could have been there. Yeah, you didn't. You didn't see it. No, I didn't see the fight. Exactly. <laughs> so, the mood, the atmosphere, everything about it was it was incredible. Yeah, and is is that sort like the people, the celebrities, the you know the the people in there appreciate that sort of compelling and exciting matchmaking that Bellator does. It, it made me feel like, um, uh, like let me, let me think about it. Alive? No, it, in like millennial terms, if okay. you if you think about like um, video gaming. Yeah. Um, what's the what's the one? There's a mine. It's like all the other organizations that are are um, corporate-y are yeah. like Minecraft. You have yeah. to build everything brick by brick for decades. Bellator is like Fortnite. Yes. It's a universe of murderers. Now you're speaking to me. There's there's things that are going on every single minute. And it's that it's that sort of exciting and interesting 
dynamic that makes it dangerous, and that's why I chose to be with Bellator. Uh, you, you and Rogan and Bravo, you guys cool now? I've never, never had a conversation other than um, you're welcome to Eddie Bravo, and I met Joe Rogan at a UFC show in Columbus probably like six or eight years ago. Yeah, you guys cool now? Because I remember you got on the mic and you told them you don't, you know, you guys don't know anything. And then you went on Instagram and then you said, oh, I just want to apologize. You actually are stupider than I thought about the sport of jujitsu. Specifically jujitsu. Yeah, yeah. Joe is a phenomenal guy. He knows his stuff on everything except for competitive jujitsu. The who's who. Right. And who was he talking about that, that, that? It wasn't the best people. He was talking about the best people in the world, and he wasn't mentioning the best people. And I'm not saying it because I think it was me. I don't think it was me, but it's guys like Philippe Pena, Lucas Lepre, who had, who's who is the most well-rounded jujitsu athlete in the world. Philippe Pena, both styles. You're not. You cannot look at a jujitsu athlete and tell me that they're the best guy if they only compete in a singular fashion. Mm. Jujitsu is both gi and no gi, and it's not even. Jujitsu is not about knowing submissions. It's about knowing movements. And it it changes the entire way that you move. Look at me, I'm a wrestler. I mm. wrestle, wrestle every single day of my life and then I discovered Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and it changed me completely. Look at Connor, Connor has a movement coach and then a grappling coach. The, what the hell is that? That's why his Jiu Jitsu is non-existent. And it will always be that way because he doesn't understand the intricacies and the, and and all the things that are happening in a, in a jiu-jitsu match. And that comes from the kimono. Mm. It doesn't come from nogi. Nogi, you, you rely more on agility and explosive behavior in matches. You see a lot more of that as opposed to when you, you watch jiu-jitsu matches in the kimono. And it, 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 it clarifies the technique. It keeps it true. It keeps it auth- authent- um, authentic. Yeah. And you know that's what I'm w- wanting to bring to the table with Bellator. When you fight for Bellator, will you stop jujitsu? Not training, but will you stop actively competing? Well, you talked about something that was, you know, was interesting. You talked about the state of jujitsu and where it's in yeah. now. And I think it's going to make a, that shift again. Uh, it's going to go back from everybody concerned about these super matches and these events. Yeah. Like, uh, for me, I, 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 I don't care about the rules. Mm-hmm. I, I just show up to give my best to myself and to the fans. That's what's important to me. I, I uh, in fact, I think the more that a competitor competes in all these different rule sets, he betters himself as a competitor and also gives the fans a, an, an, an opportunity to have some variety and otherwise uniformity. Um, but it's going to make a shift from this professional scene and these shows are going to die. Oh. They're not going to exist so anymore. This is, the, this is the right time to go over to mixed martial arts. Well, I'm leaving jujitsu jitsu to oh. be a mar- mixed martial artist. Are you retiring from jiu-jitsu? I'm not retiring from jiu-jitsu, but I'm not going to be in the scene as, as frequently. You're taking as a I break. Am. It's not a break. A hiatus. It's not a hiatus. What it's is I'm it? taking jiu-jitsu and bringing it into MMA. I got you. When do you think you'll debut? I don't know. When do you want to see me debut? January. Who do you want to see me go against? Dylan Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> You're a jerk. <laughs> I want to go against you. I don't think you Come can. On, let's move this table. <laughs> I just gave you a rash guard. Well, no, LA. Ask, call your son up and ask if you can wear it. They're doing they're doing a show in LA, so I figured they are. That's a backyard fight for you now in your adopted home state. The You're forum. Right. You know, as I was telling you about about why you want me to fight Dylan Dennis, it's kind of crazy because I think our jujitsu will nullify each other. Yeah, and it'll come. And my wrestling, which I'm a better wrestler, so I get to dictate the pace of the match. So it'll come down to striking. Yeah. And and striking, unlike as far as to my knowledge, striking is not like grappling. You can understand striking at, at a, a much faster rate than you can understand jujitsu. Spend six months in a boxing gym and spend six months in jujitsu. In your six months in jujitsu, you will feel dumber mm. than what you came in there as. Mm. And you understand you start training boxing or, or any sort of striking, it's faster to develop. And let's be honest. Let's look at Dylan Dennis's last fight. He pulled a guard. Mm. And he toe-holded the guy. What do you think he's going to toe-hold me? No, I've never I, been submitted ever. Yeah, different plans of attack for different opponents. Yeah, and, and you know, it's... Just do me a favor. 
sometimes Bellator signs guys and and it's a big splash and then we don't hear from them in a year. I just don't want, I feel like we've built a lot of momentum here today. Mm. I don't want to see you disappear for a year. So if you can just make me that promise within the next yeah. six months or so. Well, I know the value of being on the show and that's why I flew cross country to be here with You're you. You're the man. I, you know, I, I wanted to share with you a little bit of, of my story, but I also wanted to, to, to put the entire MMA world on, on notice and talk about why being at Bellator is the most exciting and compelling thing going on right now. There's a reason why I signed with Bellator. I had offers from everybody else. I chose Bellator for a reason. They're revolutionizing it. The best way to put it, like I said, in millennial terms is, is, uh, is you compare it to Fortnite. Mm -hmm. And listen, if any of these Fortnite players, anybody out there plays Fortnite and you want to help me with my Fort game, Fortnite game, I tried to play Fortnite. Have you ever tried? No, but I interviewed Ninja one time. Tell him That's that. Boy. Ask him if he can teach me how to play Fortnite uh -huh. and I'll teach him how to choke people. Okay. It's a deal. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are out of time, my friend. We've gone way over, but this has did been a we? blast. Yeah. How long did we go? We all... We almost went an hour. I had to like actually push some things back. But uh, is Warren McDonald is uh, standing. I mean, that's great. Maybe my guests are not going to be happy. But uh, look at the fight with Roy McDonald and 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 um, Gegard Mousasi. Yeah. What happened there? Well, I'd rather not comment because he's coming on the show. Well, ask him about what his. Well, uh, that's what I'm going to ask. Ask him. Ask. Ask. Um, Roy. Roy, what was going on his in, in his head when he decided to to go inverted on a guy like. Gegard Mousasi. Okay. That that was the beginning of the end. Do you remember that fight? Yeah, of I was, course. I was cage I was cage tied for that specifically, and actually the the one in San Jose, and that was that was what pushed me over to the edge with okay. Bellator. I was there in San Jose, watched, you know, Aaron Pico do his thing, and and that's you know that's been amazing watching the career of him unravel. I watched Roy McDonald, who I I had trained with before, and I, I respect tremendously as as a as a mixed martial artist. When I saw him go against when I saw the matchup between him and Gegard Mousasi I was like man this is this is going to be really interesting and then I saw an, a part of the decision making process in, in in Rory's mind that didn't make any sense to me why would you go inverted against a guy like Gegard why I'll ask him this has been great Thank thanks you. so much thanks for I really me. appreciate it no honestly the the effort to come all the way on a dime. I'll keep uh, you posted on who the please. opponent's going to be, what we You are welcome when. anytime <laughs> on this program. Before you leave, do you mind signing our banner? We're doing this thing where everyone comes and signs our banner uh, as you survey the landscape here in the uh, the studio. If you can do me that honor, that would be phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and uh, in a matter of seconds, we're going to talk to Roy. But this has been great. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. I appreciate it. Happy Thanksgiving. And good luck to you. Please enjoy, keep us posted. Enjoy your mushroom coffee. I will, I will <laughs> enjoy all of this. There he is. A.J. Agazarm. Oh, we've got some... Uh, some uh, sharpies over there. What a, what a handshake you have, by the way. And not a lot of people can pull off the um, what, what I, the turtleneck, but you can pull it off, my friend. That? Yeah, that is incredible. I mean, I could have gone another hour with you, if I'm being honest. Now you're just, no, you're just, um, I feel like the whole thing just flew by. Nice. All right, you're picking right under the, uh, the P over there. Oh, AJ, the first one to actually write on the ESPN logo. I like it. Bold, Bold. and confident really oh and there we go and a, and a square around the name to boot aj thank you so much all the best to you the newest member of bellator mma a legend oh, as they say and uh, please say hi to uh, everyone back home in california take care guys all the best i appreciate you stopping by there he is the florida boy himself putting the mixed martial arts world on notice he has come here to announce that he is the newest member of bellator mma he has signed we don't know what weight oh please don't forget your coffee by the way I won't end my coffee. and your coffee. coffee could you imagine there he is aj agazarm newest member of bellator mma uh 